a large and mounting deposit of painful memories. They also undermine hopes and efforts of many to live in peace, flourishing as individuals, flourishing as communities. And as we know, stunted lives enveloped in hopelessness throw people even deeper into conflict, even deeper into violence. You have come, I take it, because you are worried about these tensions, you're worried about these clashes, and you're seeking, just as we all are, ways to overcome them. I hope, however, that you have come to this conference also because you sense that a new wind of hope is beginning to blow and that the rays of sun are penetrating the stormy darkness around us. A common word between us and you, likely, I believe, one of the most significant interfaith documents to appear in the last 40 years, common word is one such ray shining through the barely parting clouds. The thesis of this Muslim letter, endorsed by some of the most prominent Muslim leaders worldwide and addressed to Christian leaders across the globe, the thesis of this document is very simple and it is as profound as it is simple. What binds Muslims and Christians together is their common belief in the oneness of God and the commitment to love God and to love neighbor. And this same belief and the same commitment, of course, bind Christians and Muslims to their older sibling, the original Abrahamic faith, Judaism, a faith through which God has given the world these two commandments in the first place. Now, let me remind you that the common word was written not just in an atmosphere of stormy relations between Muslims and Christians. It was also written as a response to what many Muslims have experienced as a Christian provocation. Its occasion was the famous Regensburg Address of the Pope Benedict XVI delivered in 2005. In it, the Pope quoted the Byzantine emperor who in a debate with a learned Persian Muslim said, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new and there you will find things only evil and inhuman such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Now many devout Muslims across the world felt insulted. Yet despite tensions between Muslims and Christians, yet despite this seeming provocation, key Muslim leaders gathered around the common word did not respond in kind. Notwithstanding the present conflicts, they chose the path of benevolence and beneficence, not of hatred and revenge. They insisted that commitment to love God and neighbor binds together members of these two great faiths. It has been said that God knows how to ride straight, even on crooked lines. The signatories of the common world, and above all, my dear friend, his Royal Highness Prince Ghazi, a man of deep devotion to God and extraordinary practical wisdom, who is also the spearheader of this initiative, all of them, they also wrote straight on the crooked line which the present situation offered them. The whole Christian community, indeed, I believe the whole world, owes a debt of gratitude to them for having lived up to this challenge. I trust that you will not take it as self-serving if I say that another, much smaller ray of sun penetrated the stormy clouds of Muslim-Christian relations. It was the Yale response to the common word, loving God and neighbor together. Now what was significant about this response is not that it was written or that it was written at Yale. <clears throat> what was significant was that it was endorsed by over 500 Christian leaders many of whom, some of whom are here, but many of whom heads of large worldwide constituencies representing literally hundreds of millions of Christians. And they signed it not only because their holy book tells them to live in peace with all people, but also because they sensed a danger 
a danger of global proportions if a peace between Muslims and Christians did not win over tensions and injustice. Of course, Yale's response was only one in the many responses that were to follow. The most recent one is a very fine letters, a letter of the Archbishop of Canterbury in response to the common word. But that simply underscores my point. The broad support of the Christian, of the common word in the Muslim community and the enthusiastic positive response to the common word in Christian community, they all give hope that we are poised to see a major change in Muslim-Christian relations. This is what the present conference is all about. Its goal is to contribute to the historic task of reconciliation between Muslims and Christians worldwide, to help them transition from clashes to mutually beneficial coexistence. But can one bring about a shift from what feels like a clash of civilization to conviviality of faith traditions? Can one bring such a shift by, dis by discussing what some people may describe as obscure and private issues of human devotion to God and promoting what others may deem soft and nebulous stances such as love? Should we not be grappling with hard realities of life? Should we not be discussing poverty and economic development, freedom of expression, education, stewardship of environment, pluralism, democracy, balance of power, resistance to extremists of all stripes, modes of countering violence with effective force? Should we not be discussing these things? We should. I will argue later. But the critic might continue, if religion has anything to do with this whole mess, religious passions of Christians and Muslims, single-minded devotion to God as champion of one's own cause is precisely the source of clashes rather than the means of their resolution and a catalyst of peaceful coexistence. So the critic will say, Less religion is what we need, not more. Take God out of it all, the critic will conclude, and let religious people keep their religious devotions locked in the privacy of their hearts. Restrict virtues and delights of love to the spheres of friendship and family. As to the worldly affairs, engage them by appealing to national interests and balance of power tempered by the claims of hard-nosed justice. That's a critic saying, so why are we organizing a major conference on love of God and love of neighbor? What worldly good can come of it? Well, we're organizing it partly because we don't think that love is a soft and nebulous emotion, but a tough practical virtue of benevolence and beneficence toward all, a virtue of which justice is an absolute integral part. As to religion, religious people don't find their faith impractical, obscure at all. God for them is the motivating and sustaining power, the Holy One who gives meaning, who gives weight, who gives direction to their whole life. In modern terminology, faith is really what makes them tick. But it is not just the toughness, robustness of love, and it is not just this orienting life, organizing character of faith that makes these themes socially important. Consider the undiminished vibrancy of religion in the contemporary world. To the surprise of many, especially to the surprise of the proponents of the thesis that religion will gradually retreat before the light of reason and before the benefits of technological development, especially these folks. Um, and that expectation was that the world, uh, in contrast to these expectations, the world is becoming more and more rather than less and less religious place. The data clearly shows that the world is not secularizing. If anything, it is undergoing 
a process of de-